Good day and welcome to part three of our three-part series supporting Indigenous people in mining, working towards fair and inclusion collaboration, reconciliation. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations Manager at CIM. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining this call from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We're also pleased to inform you that this webinar will be recorded and available on the Diversity and Inclusion website page. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. If you dialed in with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of the discussion. And now with further ado, I'd like to present Lana Eagle, who will be our moderator. Lana is a respected Aboriginal relations strategist with extensive experience helping Aboriginal groups build sustainable communities and economies for future generations. She believes that Aboriginal communities and industry can work together, and a large part of her work focuses on facilitating partnerships and helping organizations fulfill agreements in order to create economic development strategies and address the skills employment challenges. Welcome, Lana. Good morning, everyone. Can you, I can't see myself on the screen right now, so hopefully you can see me. Um, I am today I'm calling in from Vancouver, and that would be where um, located in the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and as well to peoples. It is an honor to be here today and to be with you to um, lead this Zoom discussion on um, reconciliation. So joining me today are two guests, Robin Sidsworth from Tech Resources. Robin has been with Tech Resources since 2011. Robin has served initially as primary legal counsel on negotiations with indigenous peoples at Tax Canadian operations. And more recently, as a Director of Government and Indigenous Affairs for Tech Steel Making Coal Business um, Unit. Robin has contributed advice and expertise on tech's community, regulatory and sustainability matters within Canada and abroad, including the development of tech's Indigenous Peoples Policy. And our other guest today is Sandra Setter. Sandra is the Aboriginal Partnerships Manager for PTW Energy Services and for CGT Industrial. She serves on several Indigenous focus boards and committees across Canada, including the National Indigenous Economic Development Board, the Métis Women's Economic Security Council for Alberta, the Circle for Aboriginal Relations Society, the Canadian Employment Equity Task Force, the Canadian Forces Liaison Council, and Careers Take on the Future. So my guests today um, are very busy people, and I'm so glad that you took time out of your busy days to join us. And really, I wanted to talk about reconciliation and where are we as a country and how far are we moving ahead? And, and sort of what are the expectations of industry? What are the expectations of um, Indigenous peoples as we move forward? We know that yesterday, June 21st, with the National Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada, and many people celebrated it differently. Um, yesterday, I had the um, honor of presenting to Tech's um, Emerging Leadership Group of people that are um, someday will be leading the company, and it was their opportunity to hear about uh, National Indigenous Peoples Day in Canada. So we were joined by two of their employees from Red Dog as well as um, an Indigenous leader who used to work at New Gold to talk about her experiences and, and what does it really mean to, to move forward. So I think as we um, educate and make people more aware of these important days, we certainly open up um, opportunities for conversation and to create awareness and better understanding. So today I just wanted to talk to two individuals who are working in this field. Um, Robin has been with Tech, as I said earlier, for 11 years. And it's during this time that he has had an opportunity to work on the side of industry 
with building relationships with uh, Indigenous peoples. And as well, he has been on his own um, path of um, growth towards reconciliation and understanding that better. So what I want to do uh, is turn it over to Robin to further introduce himself and just and give us a little bit of where he is now in his thinking and where he hopes it will go as an industry and as a country and where tech is going in all of this. Thank you, Robin. Oh, well, thank you, Lana. A pleasure to join everyone today and I'll um, uh, hopefully keep up with Sandra who's got a uh, much more interesting <laughs> experience uh, and doesn't have the same sort of technological challenges that I <laughs> have been suffering this morning. Um, uh, so. Uh, as, as Lana said, I've been with tech for quite some time and, and most of my experience working on matters of um, reconciliation and work with Indigenous peoples has come uh, through my work at tech. Um, I have been uh, really very fortunate um, at tech to work both for a company who, who from the time that I've joined has, has taken its relationships with Indigenous peoples uh, very seriously. I, I think as a company, we have grown uh, tremendously over the last uh, decade um, in thinking about how how we work constructively, how we build trust with Indigenous communities, and and I think reconciliation is increasingly a major feature of our work, particularly uh, as a company with a very long-standing history of operations in BC and Canada, um, which is a little bit unique uh, within the mining industry. So um, one of the things that I was reflecting on. Um, uh, before uh, joining the, the panel today was actually just how much personal growth uh, I have gone through um, and how much um, how much of my, you know, how I think about not just Indigenous issues, but I think all sorts of issues that have been really uh, formed uh, and, um, and shaped by a lot of the Indigenous communities I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, I, I have been really lucky to work with some exceptional uh, indigenous leaders uh, and representatives who um, have shown, uh, although I may not have recognized it at the time, remarkable uh, patience with me as I had to um, work with them on uh, typically uh, agreements um, and resolving issues. And, and they worked, um, you know, they really worked, I think uh, in ways that I now appreciate just how much energy and time they actually spent helping to educate me as an individual and how uh, how much of a gift that has actually been for me, both professionally and personally. So, um, and the reason I highlight that is I actually, when I was reflecting on what is reconciliation uh, for me as an individual, you know, I, I often do think a lot about how reconciliation is very much driven about relationships between individuals um, as, as the representatives of organizations, but that it is building trust, it is building um, the sorts of relationships that, that are valuable for both, um, for both individuals, and that that is maybe the first step in a lot of um, reconciliation between whether it's industry and, and uh, Indigenous communities or um, reconciliation for Canada more broadly, that, that our starting point is, is relationships between individuals and how we Re-establish trust, maintain that trust, and and build relationships that uh, people value. Um, and so, as I say, I I have been extremely lucky to have um, a number of uh, very thoughtful mentors uh, uh, over my years at tech. And I think for tech as a whole, that that is playing out for us more broadly. Uh, we have, uh, as some people may know, we have um, uh, announced that uh, at, at various times that reconciliation is, is a feature that we want to inform our work with Indigenous peoples. Uh, we uh, have been, uh, I think, trying to engage in more dialogue about reconciliation with our Indigenous communities. But in large part, I think, you know, we are very early in our work on this subject. And I think um, it, at times it can feel quite daunting. Uh, but one thing that, uh, that I'm reminded of uh, very frequently attack is that this is something that we we want to commit ourselves to. Uh, we don't want to come in presupposed how how reconciliation should look, and in fact, uh, that's something we hear loud and clear from our communities. And that you know the the first step in in many of our relationships, and the next step is uh, is to engage and and not avoid challenging conversations, and to be prepared to have. Um, uh, 
you know, a deeper understanding and reckoning with, with our history. And then ideally being able to talk about uh, how a reconciled future looks together. So maybe I'll pause there, um, uh, uh, Lana, and you can let me know whether I should carry on or <laughs> Well, thank you, Robin, for, for sharing that. And, and something that you touched on, I think, is really, really important. I remember um, we had at the Association for Mineral Exploration our very first reconciliation breakfast, which was sponsored by Tech. And um, our guest speaker was Chief Dr. Robert Joseph, who many of you may know and have heard from as he represents Reconciliation Canada, being one of the founding members. And we had an opportunity to have a chat as he was waiting in the green room to go on stage. And he reminded me that reconciliation starts in our hearts. And the way he spoke to me was reconciliation starts with you. He didn't mean that I would be leading reconciliation in Canada, but what he meant was it starts with us, each of us individually. So when you talk about that, that change of heart, that, that wanting to work together, willing to, um, be instructed or be led along by Indigenous people, that, that is so important. And even as Indigenous people, it's important for us to understand what reconciliation means within our own hearts. So it becomes a very heartfelt response as opposed to maybe something that's just typically intellectual. Um, it is about moving forward with our hearts first. And I think it creates um, obviously a better foundation for the industry that we're in, as well as a better country that we live in. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sandra. Now, Sandra is an amazing woman. Her, her um, bio is, is extensive, but many of you probably don't know that she is a, a, an entertainer as well. And um, I, I would said, you know, if you run out of things to say, you can always sing to us. <laughs> but Sandra, um, I'd like you to uh, tell us more about your growing up, because as I understand, you were um, raised in a non-Indigenous uh, family, and then you discovered who you, who you are, and you've been on a journey since then. So if you can tell us a bit more about that, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Lana. I thank you for having me here. It's such an honor to be with, with you and uh, with you, Robin. Lana, it, it seems like it wasn't really long ago when I first saw you speaking at, a, at an event at a mining conference in Vancouver, and, and I soaked up everything you said then, and clearly I still do. So my name is Sandra Suter, my uh, adoptive name. Uh, my birth name was Rita June McLeod, and my Indigenous name is Ogiji Dakwe, which means peaceful warrior woman, and um, it's a, an Anishinaabe name, which is uh, interesting because my elders are Blackfoot elders. I'm Métis uh, with Cree lineage and uh, raised in a non-Indigenous family. So I think that's a beautiful example of um, how it takes all of us together to create this world where reconciliation is possible. I'm coming to you from Mokinsis. I'm in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta in Calgary, which is uh, home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, to Sitina First Nation and to the Stony Nakoda peoples, as well as to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, you know, I always knew that I was Indigenous and my birth certificate doesn't identify me as Indigenous. And, and you know, there is some idea around that being because I was born in 1965, full disclosure. That's everybody here has to, you know, keep that in what happens on Zoom stays on Zoom. <laughs> but you've heard about the 60s scoop and uh, my birth mother, she was, we think uh, in retrospect, trying to protect me uh, so that I would be adopted into a good non-Indigenous family. And uh, my, my family who adopted me, I was so lucky. I was adopted into a, a wonderful family, very loving. Um, I would have to say that I know what privileges because I lived it as a young woman until I found and and really uh, until I found my birth family I got to enjoy life that way and I still do and subsequent to finding my birth family but um, my parents uh, told me that yes indeed if if they had known that I was Indigenous when they adopted me in 1965 I guess in 66 um, 
they wouldn't have because they wanted somebody that they could educate. And they told me that about six or seven years ago. And so um, I was like many of you are in, in that stunned silence of, hmm, how do I react to this? These people love me. I know they love me. Um, many of us are on a learning journey and, and so were they. And so have I been. And so about five minutes later, my dad said, but you turned out all right, dear. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it hurts even to, to say that. So Lana, when you talk about reconciliation and coming from, from our hearts, it's important that we share the things that hurt us as well as the things that encourage us and inspire us. And so when I was 30, I found my birth mother. It was a, a long and complicated search to find her. And a year later, I, I met my birth father's family. He passed tragically um, in, when he was 31 years old. He never knew about me. So I was a complete surprise to my birth family. And uh, apparently I look just like him. I uh, sound just like him. Um, and so for me, it was, ah, here they are. Here are my people. Here's where I belong. And it was an affirmation of what I had always known. I, I used to ask my parents repeatedly, are you sure that I'm not native is the word that I used at the, in those years. And they would say, no, dear, here's your birth certificate. It says clearly right here, you're Scottish and German. And yes, my Indigenous family, um, you know, they, they, like many people who grew up and evolved in a time in Canada when Indigenous people weren't valued. Many of them are urban people. Most of them are urban people um, now. Uh, you know, half of the family hid who they were and half have embraced it. And so one of the most empowering things for me in the work that I do and the learning that I've done over the years, just like you, Robin, I'm learning too. And um, is, is to have been able to watch my, my birth uncle, who I'm very close to, Uncle Gil, he found his own birth siblings because his father was different than the other children in his family. And uh, he was born of um, a man who didn't live in Saskatchewan where his mom lived, somebody who came through town who was a, a minister at the time. So he reconnected with his birth family in his 60s. And, um, you know, and some of my family, they, they uh, said, what is this residential school that you're always talking about? What is that? So we had some conversations. And a couple of years after that, my uncle Gil phoned me and he said, you know, my, my youngest brother and sister, they lived in Northern Saskatchewan. He said, and they went away to school. And I finally called them and said, did you go to residential school? And they did. And nobody in the family knew because nobody talked about it. And that's a very common thing. So for me to be able to be engaged in a, a space and an environment where I can not only help other people to know that it's good to learn about the ways of indigenous land-based people and how that can um, benefit our work, it can also benefit us and our hearts, Lana, that you were talking about earlier. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, in my journey, um, I've also learned that I don't have to keep the parts of who I am, my roles, separate. And that's something that I've learned from the elders. And so now I don't say over here, I'm a musician and over here, I work for industry and over here, I work for nonprofits or volunteer my time. Now I can be all of that in one space. And I can tell you as a woman, that is the, one of the biggest gifts I've ever been given because it's a lot of work keeping those things separate. And industry has so much to learn about that. And I think industry is coming along, letting people bring those social aspects of who they are into their workplace and understanding that that is in fact social investment. And so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, Lana, um, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for sharing a bit more about who you are and getting us to understand um, where you are in your personal journey and where you are in your journey professionally. So Robin, I'm going to um, ask you now to maybe talk a little bit more about how tech works with local communities um, on the economic side of things. Um, 
we talk about economic reconciliation and I know tech was out this long before the, that sort of buzzword came into being. So um, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about that um, as well as, um, you know, shed some light on where this is happening in the communities that you're in. Thank you. Thanks, Lana. Um, so I think there, there are a few different ways that we, that we try and work uh, in the, that economic reconciliation space. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that I think that, um, Sandra, as you say, like I think industry, including tech, we are on a journey. So I think, you know, where, where we are right now, I think, um, especially when I reflect on my time at tech, is, you know, a, a number of things that we do today that we didn't do 10 years ago. But I think, you know, these are a, um, a framework to build upon rather than a, a ceiling to hold us back. The, um, uh, what we work uh, to do with our Indigenous uh, with the Indigenous communities whose territories we're fortunate to work in is, is to negotiate agreements as a primary way uh, to uh, talk about how we, we, we might develop our minds. Now, a number of, of our operations in Canada are very long-lived, uh, and so um, that is part of the reconciliation journey for, for tech, is certainly uh, thinking about uh, that practice now of routinely negotiating agreements with Indigenous communities is on um, on a grand scale, still fairly new. So we've had agreements in place um, uh, at, at our operations. Um, it depends certainly on the agreement, but the sort of last seven or eight years. And, and a big part of those agreements and their implementation is, is really focused on economic uh, matters in addition to matters of environment and uh, cultural stewardship. So there is, I think many people on this call, I'm sure will be familiar with um, industry indigenous agreements and, and it includes many of the same concepts people will be familiar with. So, so funding, um, sharing of, uh, of revenue and, and so forth. And, and you know, that is, I think, uh, an important part of that economic reconciliation. And we have heard that from the Indigenous communities who we're fortunate to work with. Um, and then the other features that I think we, we feel are really quite critical are in that employment and procurement space where we try and uh, work on the level of Indigenous participation uh, at our operations. And I think uh, there, that is where we've, we've had uh, quite a bit of success, certainly from where we, we were 10 years ago. We, we are lucky as a, as a company, we've had a very long-standing um, operation in Alaska called Red Dog that's uh, built on uh, NANA, uh, an Alaska Native Corporation is, is the phrase there. Um, it's, it's built on their land. So there we have a very long uh, history of working and that started in the 80s. Um, and that's included uh, efforts to get uh, uh, the indigenous participation at that uh, operation uh, above 50% um, uh, of employees. And, and we've been uh, fairly successful in, in doing that. So we've tried to lean into that experience. Um, and I think we have had some success, but we, we think of it as something that we really need to build on. We're, we are seeing more employment. Uh, I think where we run into challenges um, building on our employment success, I think we are trying to work with indigenous communities to understand what are those barriers to employment. And I, I, do, I do think we hear from people that um, making sure that our workplaces are inclusive, that they are diverse, that uh, the indigenous uh, citizens uh, that that we're that we want to work for our operations that they feel welcome they feel valued and that that we are an employer of choice and I think that's where our work on uh, diversity and inclusion is really very critical uh, to our success together because I, I think we would say uh, and this has certainly been something that I've heard from from indigenous communities uh, as well when a workplace is inclusive and I think Sandra you're your point about how people feel like they can be them whole, their whole selves at work. It actually, I have heard from a number of, of people how important that is um, to how comfortable, how confident um, and, and how much they want to work uh, with us. And we do feel like employment is one of those ways that we can contribute most actively to economic reconciliation. So it's a big focus for us. And it's, um, it's not easy. Those are the sorts of workplace cultures things that I would say uh, when I talk to others at tech, people take really very seriously, but building that culture, that confidence uh, for others uh, does take time. And I think that's, you know, just an area of, of constant and continual effort. Um, 
Yeah, and then and then procurement. We we uh, are working with indigenous communities to to try and increase the amount of work they're doing and to help uh, understand what kind of uh, business uh, community they value and how we can uh, collaborate together to help build that. That can be tricky. Procurement is a uh, um, often an area uh, where there's uh, there can be some some tension. Uh, certainly uh, between, uh, you know, service providers and <laughs> the service receiver. But uh, but our real efforts there, I think, are to where we do have challenges, where we do have setbacks, to see them as opportunities, to see them as a, as a way for both us to learn how we can be better partners and also uh, to work in a collaborative spirit to help build a more resilient uh, business community. Thank you, Robin, for sharing that. So that that provides a really good segue into what I would like Sandra to talk about. And it was just uh, a couple of weeks ago where the National uh, Indigenous Economic Strategy was announced. And this is a strategic um, approach to um, economic um, prosperity, uh, building economic opportunities for Indigenous people by Indigenous people. So um, Sandra, if you could talk a bit more about that, you were on the uh, one of the people that uh, brought this together. And um, where do you see this going in terms of the future of our country? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about the National Indigenous Economic Strategy. It's uh, a work that's very close to my heart. It's a, a living document, and I think, you know, it, it came out of, uh, in 2020, the OECD, the Organization, Organization for Economic Community Development, um, it uh, released a report called Linking Indigenous Communities to Regional Development, and they recommended that Canada develop a national Indigenous economic strategy. So subsequent to that, um, more than 25 national Indigenous organizations got together to um, take a, an initiative towards accomplishing that and drafting as Indigenous organizations, this is what we've got now, the National Indigenous um, Economic Strategy. And uh, so that was at that time. And over the next two years, um, there were a core group of people who were extremely engaged in, in developing the four strategic pathways that you see on your screens, which are people, lands, infrastructure, and finance. So those, those organizations that uh, did that work included the National Indigenous Economic Development Board, included NACA, the, the uh, CCAB, CANDU, and Indigenous Works. And then um, after we developed the 107 calls to economic prosperity, we included um, our advisory body, which includes um, the AFOA. Um, I guess I should back up and maybe spell out some of those uh, core group names. Sorry about that. Um, so the National uh, Aboriginal Capitals Corporations Association is NACA and CCAB is the, um, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Relations and CANDU is the Canadian Association of Native Development Officers and then Indigenous Works, you know. So, the advisory body included uh, the Aboriginal Financial Officers Association. Um, the Assembly of First Nations were invited to provide comments, the Nazi Corporation, and the National Aboriginal Trust Officers Association. And we had several organizations in peer review for this document, um, as well as uh, some academics, Indigenous academics involved in the literature review. It's been um, introduced in both French and in Uktut, as well as in English, and is available at niestrategy.ca, as you can also see. So it, it builds on the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report with a focus on the economic aspects of reconciliation and a pathway to greater prosperity for every Canadian. And I think it's really important to you know, to when you think about industry and some of the things that Robin was talking about that tech is doing, many companies, um, BC, I think Lana, you talked about this at, at the mining conference before COVID locked us down. Um, you talked a little bit about how do we, you know, when BC implemented the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into legislation, nobody knew how to do that. And um, the same with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 
report and and all of the matters that came out of that industries and lawyers sorry robin um, you know human resources professionals are very risk averse and companies governments don't know how to implement what we need to implement um, and communities don't have the capacity uh, not all communities have the capacity to counsel industry and government on what needs to happen for their communities to be prosperous and healthy. And so this was a, an excellent opportunity to bring leaders from across Canada together, thought deep and deep thinking that can help industry to be able to actually implement the United, ne United Nations Declaration into their policies and structures, governance structures, you know, and to do that for the benefit of everyone in Canada. Um, you know, all Canadians benefit from the natural resource development on the lands of Indigenous peoples. And Indigenous peoples want to reclaim self-sufficiency. So, so the, uh, the National Indigenous Economic Strategy gives us a blueprint. It's a living document again, and uh, comments on um, and questions are welcome. The First Nations University is going to be um, focused on monitoring and implementing uh, the National Indigenous Economic Strategy activities across all levels of government, of industry, of Indigenous organization and communities and others. Um, and uh, we'll be seeking capacity, developing capacity to be able to do that. And that's one of the really important pieces of the strategy is Indigenous peoples need to have their own institutions to be able to help all of Canada achieve reconciliation. So um, I think that this strategy with its four pillars, there are 107 calls to Indigenous, um, to economic prosperity for Indigenous peoples within it. I, I think it's the beginning of the answer and, and uh, I'm very interested in what people have to say about it or questions that people might ask in the Q and A. Um, this, this um, book that we have, the English version, it has case studies at the end. All of the contributors are identified. There's, there's a whole bunch of links and information where you can do deep dives into how to implement the recommendations into your own organization. And um, I am ecstatic that we're able to talk about it today. So I'll leave it at that. And if you have um, specific questions, then we can dive a little deeper into some of the topics. Thank you, Sandra. I think that's where we are as a country. I think people are starting to understand why we need reconciliation, but I think people are, are maybe uh, struggling a little bit to understand better how can we achieve reconciliation. And so um, I think this um, type of resource is really, really important for um, Canadian industry, as well as government. And uh, I'm just curious, um, what has the reception been so far to this um, strategy? It's been fantastic. Um, you know, I think when you think about how difficult it has been in Canada for people to not fight about something, right? Like somebody says X, Y, Z equals two. And somebody else says, no, it doesn't, it equals four. Whatever the, the example is, we've only had um, one negative response to that I'm aware of to the National Indigenous Economic Strategy. And that was also important for us to be able to experience because you know, it's, it reflects how we're changing in Canada. We were very concerned that uh, there would be a lot of um, backlash, but we gathered as 25 national Indigenous organizations. This is a inclusive of so many perspectives, you know, minds from across the country who've been doing this deep thinking and this work for years. So now that we're allowed to go to school and now that we're allowed to be lawyers, now that we're allowed to work and not go to jail, now that we're allowed off the reservation without a pass, look what's happening. We're reclaiming that prosperous environment that we always had. And, you know, this is something that's become topical for Canadians and across the planet. 
since the children came to light last June. Nobody can deny that the impacts of colonization in Canada are real. And nobody can say that they don't have a part to play in that. And so as we honor those children by implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, we'll all be able to help them find their way home and find our way to returning to our natural way of being, which is together on this planet. It takes all of us. And so, you know, I think um, it's just, it's been a, a fantastic uh, uptake and people are downloading this information all over the world, not just in Canada. And I, I don't think any of us could have anticipated the immediate positive reaction to the National Indigenous Economic Strategy, but we came together and did it together in a good way. And uh, I don't know that we would have been able to do this quite as productively without being locked down for two years because we met like pretty much every two weeks, if not more frequently, some of the, some of the uh, core members were working over weekends and evenings, uh, really heavy lifting done by, by many of them, not, not as much by me, um, because um, I think that there are people who've had, like Don Madabi Leach, Marie Delorme, uh, Shannon Matatawaban, uh, they have, they work with indigenous organizations and indigenous people in economic development in their organizations. Kelly Lindsay from uh, Indigenous Works and Can Do, they have direct experience serving Indigenous frontline companies and communities. My experience is working with an electric and instrumentation company and a mining uh, construction company that build relationships with Indigenous communities. So it takes all of our perspectives to build something that that can be a starting ground as a living document for this work. But, but those people, I have so much respect and, and kudos to them for really doing the deep thinking and heavy lifting on producing this voluminous, extremely, how can you tell I'm excited, right? It's just, everybody should download it immediately because it's gonna help you even if you read just the executive summary, right? Or just the case studies at the back and see the amazing things that have been happening. Like Clearwater, what an amazing story that is, right? And uh, more coming on that. When you have uh, fisheries and oceans in the 80s who were had to cease doing what they did and now the Mi'kmaq communities own Clearwater, right? It's a billion dollars of investment. That's something all of Canada can be proud of. You know, that's just one example. There are many. Great, thank you for sharing, Sandra, from your heart. You're clearly excited about this. I'm just gonna switch topics just a tiny bit um, and I'll preclude it with a story. And pardon me to those who've heard this story just recently, but it was probably about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago now that I was invited to speak to a grade four class here in Coquitlam about reconciliation. Now they had um, been part of Minerals Ed, which is a nonprofit society here in BC. And they had learned about mineral exploration and mining. And they even learned about Aboriginal rights and title and all of that. So I was kind of like the, the bow on the gift to wrap it all up and, and help bring some meaning from a reconciliation viewpoint. I was probably more nervous about presenting to them than to anyone, just because, you know, children grade four level there, they can criticize a little bit, but um, one little girl put up her hand at the end and, and she wanted to know, um, how can we, we're so young, how can we um, make any change and, and move out, you know, like she was talking about reconciliation. And so, you know, putting me on the spot, but I said, here is an opportunity to talk about what you learned today to people that, that are in your life, to your family, to your figure skating club, to your swim club, to your friends, to talk about what you learned today about reconciliation and why it's so important to move forward. And, you know, I think we can all talk. And even as adults, we can talk about what we learned today, the importance of working with Indigenous peoples. And I think that this document 
is really um, a way to help you find out answers on how to move forward for your company and what you can do to work with Indigenous peoples. It provides that blueprint, that that strategy, that roadmap. Um, so Robin, you had mentioned when you were talking about um, diversity and inclusion, and that is something else that is um, certainly taking um, a prominent place in what we discuss, you know, in our workplace. And I know at PDAC, uh, we talk about um, equity, diversity and inclusion. So maybe from your standpoint, Robin, what creates an inclusive environment for all people? But in, in today we're talking about Indigenous people. Um, how do we create that inclusive environment in our workplace? Uh, that is a great question, which I would normally defer to HR. Uh, but it's too late and I can't call them. Um, you know, I uh, we're very fortunate actually, we've got um, a director of diversity and inclusion, Jackie uh, Scales is her name, who's, who's uh, much more eloquent on this subject than I, but I, I will do my best to channel her. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think, in my, I mean, it's, it's interesting. The, the reason I, if I sound a bit hesitant, one of the reasons I sound a bit hesitant is that I certainly realized that um, as a uh, white male, um, you know, I'm in an extremely privileged uh, position uh, and, and particularly so in the mining industry. And so my, my sense of what makes for a diverse and inclusive uh, workplace is, is actually not really that important in my view. Um, I think what often makes a diverse and inclusive workplace when, when I've heard from uh, those employees and, and colleagues whose I think opinions matter much more than mine is, is they feel that their workplace supports them and values them for who they are. And that we, you know, that, that they are, and I'm reflecting more, Sandra, I think on your, your great words earlier about, about their whole selves, that I think when we have a workplace where people know that who they are is valued and that what we what we hope for is that they actually do bring their whole selves to work and that that is something the company values, that we aren't asking them, uh, they don't have to be successful um, or success is not gonna be driven by, by figuring out how to compartmentalize or how to uh, play a part or put on a mask at work, that in fact, that's not what will, let you, uh, will make you successful. It is bringing your whole self to work and that that's the sort of workplace that we need. But again, I'm I'm in an extremely privileged position, and I, I do try and acknowledge that. And so, one of the other things I think we need to do is is reach out to our indigenous employees, engage them in dialogue that that they trust, that they find meaningful, so that we can understand how we're doing. Because that's uh, you know we we won't have the workplace we want, I think, until all of our employees feel that it is diverse and inclusive, and and so. Um, that's something we need to define and work on together. Thanks, Robin, for saying that. Um, I've heard it said even simpler than, than what you said, although what you said is really important when we begin to value um, people around us. But um, from, from a standpoint from, from me, it's when I feel I belong. And, um, you know, I think when we, when we look at it that way, we are taking into account um, people's um, their own thoughts and, and what and how they must feel. So um, to be not talked to during um, coffee breaks or lunch times or not made to feel like you're one of the people that that actually works there, I think must be um, a huge challenge uh, to, to face that every day. And so we're, we're all different. Um, and um, some of us are Indigenous. Some of us may have um, different um, genders and those things may be hard to understand, but I think like you have said, when we begin to value those differences, um, those different places that people come from, um, then we begin to open up our minds and we become more inclusive of everyone that we work with. So I'll, I'll ask the same question of you, Sandra. What does inclusion mean to you as an Indigenous woman and um, how Indigenous people feel about inclusion, you know, in the places that you have um, communicated with Indigenous people, whether it's in your own workplace or whether it's um, through the organizations that you um, belong to? Yeah, it's such an important conversation to have when you consider that there's a, a glut in the work 
workforce across industry, across government, we, you know, everybody's looking for employees and where are they going to come from? For industry, they're going to come from Indigenous communities because that's where development takes place. And maybe for everybody, because, you know, there's a fifth of the workforce, projected needs in the workforce can be filled by Indigenous peoples. So, yeah, I, I think it's really important that we replicate wise practices that we've seen and we can look at the people's pillar in the national indigenous economic strategy as well for some guidelines around how to um, incorporate some ideas into that but for me inclusion in the workplace um, of indigenous peoples and, and women and the other disadvantaged air quote groups in canada um, we need to create what people refer to as a safe workspace too. And how do you do that without creating divisiveness somehow? You know, that person gets more than I did because they smoke and they go on their smoke breaks all the time. Do you remember that conversation? Um, maybe I should take up smoking so that I get more time off my shift to go have a cigarette break. Um, you know, uh, so that's, you know, an analogy, not quite a parallel, but for me, I think we've implemented at the companies that I work for a slogan that's I'm always impressing upon people first, people's first. If you can remember that language in your mind, then the minute you start thinking about something you want to do, you'll think first, people's first. How can I include the first people of Canada in what I'm anticipating to do? Who do I need to talk to? And, you know, with that community first focus, um, one of the other things that we do is we recognize that industry often goes first to chief and council because they're the political leaders and that's the Western system who makes the decisions. Well, when you think about that patriarchal Western system, even in families, the fathers are perceived to make the decisions, but who really makes the decisions in a family? It's the women. So in communities, it, you know, chief and council system is uh, something that exists in most communities, but who really holds the community, you know, and, and that might be hereditary leaders, it might be chief and council, but it might be the elders who have been watching things for a long time. So how do we involve the elders who know communities and who are so inclusive and wise in my workspace? How do I include elders in my workspace? We have a spirit room in our head office here in Calgary where elders can come to smudge and pray and meet anytime they want. And the first time that they came to our facilities, I didn't do this. An ally in our company did this. I had said, could you make sure that there's parking close to the door available for the elders? Because it was winter time. So he went out and hung uh, signs on all of the close parking spaces after making people move too farther away that said elders only. <laughs> so, so they're driving into an unfamiliar environment where they're a little, oh, this is a company. I don't know how this is going to go. A little bit intimidated, right? And they see this elders only parking signs. What a, a well thought out thing. I had nothing to do with it, right? It was just, I drove up and I'm like, wow, that's nice. I like that. So the small things make a difference in an inclusive workplace too. And uh, I think that that's, that's incredible that, that he did that. And so, yeah, they, they like to talk about my company and say, remember this, and this company did this for us. And, and uh, yeah, thank you, Lana. That's one example. Thank you. So I think at this time, I will turn it over to Cassandra uh, for the Q&A. If there are any questions from the audience, um, you've had an opportunity perhaps to type them into chat and uh, I'll let Cassandra uh, take over right now. Right. Well, thank you everyone and, and Sandra and Robin. Um, thank you so much for sharing. It, it was really insightful. Um, so I'll welcome anyone who does have questions to post them in the chat. In the meantime, there are just a couple. And uh, I guess just following up on the topic of being able to bring our whole selves to work and, and the value of that. Um, what, in your opinions, can we all be doing to help accelerate that, that culture change and building the trust that's required for that to happen? That's a, a great question. Robin, um, 
You know, I think, <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Robin talked early about establishing trust in, at tech and in that work. And, and how do you do that? You know, I think you have to, you have to lead by example. So I, I, I think that there's, we, we have a lot of conversations around ESG, right? Indigenous uh, have, people have been doing ESG long before it became ESG. But um, I think when you think about social investment as part of what industry is currently embracing within ESG, there's actually a way for industry to encourage employees to bring their whole selves to work um, by celebrating them. But somebody's got to be vulnerable and step into that and become an example that other people can reflect on and look at. And some companies are there, some areas are there, and some are not. I know many Indigenous leaders in C-suite positions, executive positions, who don't self-identify because they don't feel safe self-identifying at their level. So can they? Can we start with our senior executives in our company and have a conversation with those team members about who here is diverse in some way? And how are you willing to step into being that in our organization visibly and publicly? On to you, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> uh well, I'm not sure, I, I, as has as, uh, been the case for this entire talk, I, I don't have anything really of value to add on top of Sandra. <laughs> She's much more eloquent and thoughtful on these uh, subjects. I mean, I, it is interesting, Lan, I was reflecting on your story about um, the grade four students and, and that what can, what can I do? And I do think sometimes when we think about, you know, how do, how do we help make an inclusive and diverse workplace, it can feel very overwhelming because you think, well, I don't know, how do I get, you know, we've got 10,000 people, how do we get all of us to be supportive? And, and, but Sandra, your point is actually similar. Well, we all have our own little sphere of influence. So I, I do, and I, I do try and do this. I'll, um, I know there's some tech people on the call. Uh, they can <laughs> let me know hopefully later and not on chat how I do, how I do in practice. But but actually, I think we can think about, well, like, what am I doing today to help the people around me feel like they belong? You, you know, what, what am I doing? Am I like, you know, they can, it can be simple things. Are you just remembering to talk to people when you see them at the office or are you checking in? Are you just asking how they're enjoying work or how they're finding things? You know, are you trying to uh, build the sorts of relationships where you probably don't have to start by saying, uh, to your indigenous colleagues, I'd like to have a really important conversation with you about how I can support you in reconciliation, but you probably can just make sure you're there, that you are actually doing your part by actually being supportive, by actually championing them and helping them in their work. And I think some, sometimes because the, the challenge can feel quite daunting, it can be hard to remember that actually there is lots of little things that we can do just in terms of how we work together and how we value our own colleagues and making sure that you do reflect your, you know, uh, you do your best to reflect those values in your own work. Uh, and that's a great place to start. I totally agree. I think that it does start with just little things, um, whether it's um, saying hello to the teller at Shoppers Drug Mart or whether it's smiling to your waitress and having a conversation when you're out for lunch or even just walking down the street and there's a total stranger and you you give a, a, a quick acknowledgement with a head nod. For, as me, and I'm sure Sandra can relate to this as, as an Indigenous woman, that is something that we, we often meet up with um, Indigenous people on the street and it's it's important to smile or if it's a gentleman, you know, I could give a quick head nod, but it's just what we do in our culture. And it's amazing how a smile and being friendly can go a long way. So if we bring that to the workplace, when we are not afraid to say good morning, how's your day going? Those kinds of questions to be inviting and to be kind and thoughtful and inclusive, it really begins to work wonders. And so a new employee might go, you know, I really like working at tech. They're all really friendly people. And I think that that 
says a lot then about a company, but if we run to our office, heads down, never say a word to anybody, it creates a totally different work environment. So any other questions, Cassandra? Yes. There's two more. There's um, a quick one for Sandra, just asking about the title of the book that was mentioned. Did I mention a book? I think on the <laughs> National Indigenous Economic Strategy. Is it available from the website? Oh, uh, yeah, the in all three languages, the niestrategy.ca uh, is available. And I know lots of books. So if anyone wants to reach out to me after, I, I'd be happy to make some recommendations of my favorites for sure. <laughs> I'm having a new idea of our uh, CIM, <laughs> CIM book club coming up for 2023's program year. <laughs> and uh, a question for Robin um, that uh, you mentioned the increase, uh, increasing Indigenous employment. And so the question is the Western way of work and the types of job, the full-time lifestyle considered, oh, sorry, is the Western way of work and the types of job with the full-time lifestyle considered attractive to Indigenous community members? And uh, so with respect to increasing Indigenous employment, um, curious to learn about unique barriers to that. Uh, that is a great question, and I think it's a really astute uh, observation. And and it's interesting, maybe that um, due to COVID, I think there's a more of a, a general societal rec reckoning with how is work meant to function for lots of people, and what does what does healthy work that supports you know healthy communities, healthy families actually look like. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, claim too much uh, direct experience in this, but it it is I think something that that we do hear from. Indigenous employees and communities that that often the structure of of work, particularly in 24 seven, you know, resource type um, industries doesn't always suit uh, Indigenous uh, employees and what they need to be uh, to, to actually feel a sense of belonging at work and for their employment to support them in their role uh, for their families and their communities. And, you know, this is maybe more of a personal observation, but I, I think most of us we do choose employment pathways that do support those other parts of who we are and what we're trying to do. We, we want our employment to be an important part of, of what we do, but, but actually it, if, you, if your employment doesn't allow you to contribute to your family, to your community in the way that you want, it's that tension is going to be really hard. So I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's easy solutions to some of those, to some of those challenges. I don't, you know, I think if there was a, if there was a really simple solution, I would like to hope that we would have already done it. But I do think that with the way that work is changing, there may be more opportunities over time. Um, I'm sure Sandra, there's probably others here who comment on this as well, but but the nature of, of the extractive sector is changing a lot in terms of the types of, of roles uh, and skills that the industry will need over the next 20 years are not really this, the exact same that they needed the last 20. I think we will see that we'll have a, a much higher uh, percentage of our workforce is going to be in professional technical services. And they, they're, that I think will open up opportunities for flexibility. The remote work possibilities, I think, are really tremendous. It is something we have heard from, from a number of Indigenous communities and, and employees. If they have to travel for work, if they have to be out of their community, it's, it's a non-starter uh, for them. Well, it given the last two years, we've, we are maybe opening up ways to work in that might be more supportive. So I think those are, those are all, you know, very emerging areas that we have to lean into, but I'm quite hopeful that, uh, and in part, the reason I'm hopeful is I, I hear lots of really great ideas from uh, Indigenous leaders, Indigenous um, uh, employees about how we can keep uh, improving in that space. Thank you. Did you have any comments to add, Sandra? Yeah, I, I, well, just want to uh, say that it's really, you know, there are wise practices that have been developed in this area by lots of different places. And, and I think mentorship is really important. And, you know, also hiring more than one employee at a time from a community so that there's somebody else there who really gets um, some of the specific barriers and difficulties that Indigenous people have, as well as having an elder on call, 1-800-CALL-YOUR-ELDER 24-7, you know, from, you know, or a group of elders, because there will be people from different communities working at a place like tech at all of your facilities, for instance. But 
those are some of the things that uh, have evolved in wise practices that I've seen and, and think are amazing and uh, implementable. Is that a word? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> are we good, Cassandra, for questions? That, that does wrap up the questions. Um, uh, thank you for a really thoughtful discussion. I know, I feel I've learned quite a lot today. So um, on behalf of you know, myself, my colleagues, and, and everyone else on the line, I really appreciate your time and energy towards this. Uh, a really good way, I feel, to, to wrap up our, our webinar series for, for this season. Great. Well, thank you, Cassandra, for all your hard work in bringing this together and that of your team. And my heartfelt thanks to both Robin and Sandra for participating today and for helping us open up our hearts to what reconciliation can look like in industry and in our country. Once again, thank you to both of you and everyone have a great day. Bye now.